Hello everyone, this is Ali, and this video is the fifth episode of War vs. My YouTube channel where I analyze the lore of characters from the Warcraft and World of Warcraft series of games and oppose them to decide who will win in the duel to the death. The point is to know who is the best, of course, but the main purpose is to share my view of interesting what-ifs. I'm from France and English is not my native language. Please tell me if you hear any mistake and tell me in the comments. Liadrin and Nubundo appeared at the same time with the release of World of Warcraft's first expansion, The Burning Crusade. At the time, shamans could only be played by rolling as a horde race and paladin by rolling as an alliance race, and the inclusion of blood elves and drainers into the game changed that. The law of blood knights was added to allow blood elves to roll as paladins, and that of the broken shamans to allow the drainer to play as shamans. The stories of Liadrin and Nabunda were meant to reflect this, as they were both the first to offer his opportunities with their races. As such, their stories are quite similar, and they were directly opposed by the war between the Blood Elves and Draenei, until the defeat of Kil'jaeden and the resurrection of the Sunwell. Since then, they are often parallel as the leaders of their respective class orders and their respective factions, and their stories of lost faith and renewed hopes are very similar, which is why I want to make them fight to the death. Yep, for the Adrian, I'd assume that a current pick is right now, during the course of a sixth expansion of World of Warcraft, Legion, having acquired a great deal of battle experience and the legendary sword Quel'Dala. It's a bit more complicated to determine the part of his life when Nabunda was at his best, but since we're definitely taking his broken version into account, it appears clear that his peak is at the same time, during the Legion expansion, so that he may have as much battle experience as possible. The drums of war thunder once again. Liadrin was an adult female blood elf born at least decades before the First War in the Thalassian capital of Silvermoon. Orphaned early by Amani trolls who murdered her parents, she was raised and educated by High Priest Vandalore, developing a strong relationship with the light and an intense hatred against the Amanis. A close friend of Lothimar Firon and Dark Androfir, she became priestess of the light herself and took on an apprentice, the young Galel. She notably came to clash against warlord Zhu Jin himself at the side of Ranger General Haldrun Brightwing before and during the Second War. She was a part of a squadron that captured Zhu Jin and strongly opposed the tortures the Rangers inflicted upon him, trying to convince Haldrun to kill him quickly without being needlessly cruel. Before they could resolve the debate, the group was attacked by the Amanis and Zhu Jin managed to escape. The true start of Ladin's story came with the Third War and the collapse of her civilization. As a high priestess, she witnessed the fall of Silver Moon, the slaying of her master and her king, and participated in the battle in which the Scourge corrupted the Sunwell. She survived with her body unscathed, but not her mind. She considered that the Holy Light had fully abandoned and betrayed the elves and abandoned it herself. When Prince Kael'thas Sunstrider returned to Silvermoon and secured the Sunwell, she fought once again for her land, but with a weapon in hand. She had become a warrior, and for years she lived a solitary life of destroying the taint of the scourge in Quel'Thalas and struggling with her addiction to the arcane energies of a lost Sunwell. She was eventually summoned to Silvermoon by Grand Magister Romarth and Astalor Bloodsoon, to whom Kael'thas and San Muru the Naru the prince had captured in our then, so that they may drain its magic. Magisters had a different plan, however, offering to Liadrin the opportunity to reclaim the power of the light again by forcefully taking it from Muru, to be both a priestess and a warrior, and be an entirely new kind of soldier. Liadrin agreed and became a light-infused fighter, a paladin of swords, thus founding the Order of the Blood Knights. The Blood Knights became a powerful yet distrusted force in Seven Moon's power. They reclaimed large parts of Quel'Thalas 
and had she fired the ephors of dark and fear to destroy and turn them into death knights of the scourge. Liadrin's former apprentice, Galel, notably joined the order in an effort to quell his magic addiction, but this only made things worse as he became completely mad and turned into a wretch Liadrin had to kill, much to her dismay. She was completely crushed when Prince Kilfaz betrayed his people to ally with Kil'jaeden and stole Muru from Silvermoon. Desperate, Liadrin traveled to Shatraf to humbly beg for the forgiveness and help of Adar, leader of the Na'aru. To her great surprise, it explained that Velen, the prophet of the Draenei, had foretold of Muru's fate in the following words. Silvery moon, washed in blood, led us try into the night, Armed with sword of broken light, broken and then betrayed by one, standing there bestride the sun. At darkest hour, redemption comes in nightly ladies sown to blood. Muru had let itself be captured so that the redemption of the blood elves could come, as according to the prophecy. And Yadrin understood how much the creatures she had fought and abused had sacrificed for her people, out of pure compassion. Accomplishing the last part of the prophecy, the Adrian of the Blood Knights joined with the Shattered Sun Offensive, ending the conflict with the Draenei. After the defeat of Kael'thas and Kael'jaeden, the Adrian was fully repentant of the treatment of Muru, and witnessed as Venom resurrected the Sunwell as a fountain of arcane and light by merging the heart of Muru with it. Bathed in holy energy, the Adrian reformed a much more positive relationship with the light, becoming respectful and loving of it once again now that she drew its power from the sun well. Following this, the Blood Knights fully joined the war effort against the Lich King, their greatest enemy, and Yadrin eventually came to acquire the Rune Blade Quel'Dala after it was reforged in the holy currents of the sun well. She led her paladins against the Burning Legion ever since, the greatest threat the Cinderai had to suffer, participating in the destruction of the Shadow Council in the alternate Draenei you know, and the defeat of Gul'dan and Terengor. Alongside the Pony Drathmane, Maxwell Tyrosus and other Paladin leaders from all around Azeroth, she agreed to form a great order of the Silver Hand and fight in the service of its High Lord to destroy the demons. She notably repaired the Knights of the Ebon Blade's attack upon Nice Hope Chapel, and participating in the Battle of the Exodar alongside Venan before joining the great conflict in the Broken Eyes to save Suramal and her newfound Night Boar brethren in an uneasy alliance of the Night Elves against the Burning Legion, and participating in the Battle of Nighthold, which saw the death of Gul'dan and the return of Illidan Stormrage on Azeroth. She is quite likely to evolve again in the later years of World of Warcraft. Nabunda was an aged male Draenei, born a long yet unknown time before the First War, in an unknown world, the immortality of the Draenei preventing us from estimating his age, which could be counted in decades, centuries, or tens of thousands of millennia. As the indicator for the first part of his life, Nabunda was a brave soldier of the light, ready to sacrifice everything, and when the Orc started the genocide of the Draenei race, he was one of the volunteers who remained behind in Chatraf city to delay the horde and food it into thinking that they had wiped the entire race out. At the start of the battle, an explosion of red mist was released upon the Draenei, poisoning them with fed energy. Nubundu was engaged in a fight against Gromash Hellscream, whose hand he managed to crush with his hammer atop the walls of the city. Nubundu was actually winning but started vomiting torrents of blood and found that he was incapable of using the light to fight or heal himself. Grom pushed him off the wall, and Nabunda woke up to the screams of the innocent butchered by the horde and the smell of blood and death. His leg broken, sick and unable to call upon the light, Nabunda fled north, away from the battlefield, smothered by the guilt of having failed those he was supposed to protect. Nabunda rejoined with the other survivors, but soon his body began to twist and change, the red mist that corrupted it, transforming him into a deformed mutant called Kukul by his Draenei brethren, meaning broken. 
The scars inflicted by the orcish warlocks prevented him from ever using the light again. And worse, the healthy Draenei began to ostracize and chase away the broken. His bodies and minds degraded further and further. A former friend of Nabundo even confiscated his hammer of an Aru, the symbol of his status as a Vindicator. Many broken degraded even further, turning into swam treading mongrels called the Lost Ones. Nabundo was plagued by nightmares and he had climbed on top of a mountain every day to pray and call upon the light to return to him, without ever losing faith. He did this for many years, like a hermit lost in the desert, praying despite his complete hopelessness, and one voice he didn't expect to hear answered him, that of the wind. Having learned to listen to nature itself, Nabundo traveled to Nogran, guided by the elements, and there, the spirits taught him the art of shamanism and the life teeming in everything that is. Nabunda returned to the broken and taught them too, renewing hope, and eventually convinced the prophet Velen, leader of the Draenei, of the worthiness of his path. Velen accepted this and ordered his people to accept the broken into their midst and stop oppressing them. From then on, Nabunda's guilt was relieved and his nightmares stopped. Following this, Nabundo became the most prominent shaman among the Draenei of the Alliance and a member of the Earthen Ring, making this circle of shamans a place of peace between the Alliance and the Horde. Becoming a friend of Thrall and a frequent representative of the Alliance in intentional efforts alongside the Horde, he strongly advocated for the destruction of the Shah during the war in Pandaria. Since then, he fought in the Battle of the Exodar and helped the Earthen Ring make Prince Fenderan into the Elemental Lord of Air so that the full force of Azeroth's elements could be able to unleash itself against the invasion of the Burning Legion in World of Warcraft 6 expansion. He is very likely to evolve again in the future history of the game. Yadrin and Nabundo both symbolize the heavy struggles endured by their people and the drastic changes of power that it took from them to find an impossible way to renew hope. They both follow different paths and tirelessly sought redemption for their failures, and their relationships to members of the other faction make them an important factor for the peace between the Alliance and the Horde. Their mirror images are what the Alliance and the Horde found to save themselves in the culture of a usual enemy. And that's why I'm making them fight over death. Because, well, you know, fun. And to you know who's the strongest between Paladins and Shamans. Not gonna pick a side here. My child, I watched with pride as you grew into a weapon. Of righteousness. Lady Liadrin is a blood elf, a warrior coming from one of the most magically enhanced elven races of Azeroth. Although smaller and less muscular than even humans, blood elves have kept from their Quelveray ancestry a great longevity and resistance to disease but they were considerably weakened by the destruction of the Sunwell, which furnished them with magical energy to sustain their bodies. The withdrawal heavily weakened them, sometimes distorted them, and the Sundaray had to live with that fear and that weakness until the rekindling of the Sunwell by the Horde of Muru, which is now slowly inducing holy energy to the Blood Elves, slowly making them better. As a blood knight trained for battle and to receive boons from the Sunwell and the Holy Light, Liadrin is notably boosted physically by this, as well as strong and sturdy enough to fight in heavy armor with a two-handed sword. She is very likely to be one of, if not the most physically powerful blood elf alive. A notable fact about Liadrin is that after the recognition of the Sunwell, her eyes took on a bright golden glow unlike the fell green lingering in much of her brethren.
The window is broken. A drain eye with a distorted face and torso, heavily swollen legs and arms and hooves dividing themselves into grotesque tools. Being broken also means being at a high risk of suffering from physical and mental health issues, and although shamanism made him completely fine with the mental area, he still slumped and slow like an old creature. He can sometimes be seen wearing medium shamanic armor that is usually clothed and probably can't fight in plate anymore. The scars of war will remain within his broken body until the day he dies, and even if his connection with nature and earth is likely to make him reasonably sturdy and strong. Although trainers are naturally much stronger physically than blood elves, the Adrian has been made better by the Sunwell and the Bundo remains considerably weakened, even if his bond with the elements helps him mitigate the damage. Even if he might be able to physically hold his own, he would definitely lack Yadrin's agility. The comparison makes it clear, the physical edge goes to Yadrin. Fight! Kill! Salute! Yadrin started being a warrior after the fall of Quelthalas, but she was exposed to war long before, and thanks to this, her training into an able fighter was quick. Having been both a priestess and a warrior, she was an extremely potent blood knight, likely to be the finest of the order. When she is faced in battle by alliance players attacking Silver Moon, she demonstrates impressive speed and strength and there are not that many in Azeroth and Draenor who would face her one-on-one -on -one in direct combat, even among warriors, even if she relies on the holy abilities. Nabundo used to be a Vindicator, a heavy armored fighter wielding a hammer of an Aru who was talented enough to crush Cromash Hellscream's hand while posing by the red mist released upon Chatra. As such, he must have been an extremely able combatant, but this talent of his was destroyed when he turned into a broken. Ever since then, he became a wise shaman, more keen in meditation, coding and healing than in physical fighting, even if broken drain eye remained heavy enough to inflict a great deal of damage. He should be able to do that, if necessary, and despite his body and his lack of practice, he must retain his extensive knowledge of battle. It's difficult to assess the exact amount of training and practice either combatant has, but one clear thing is that prior to his transformation into a broken, Nabunde would have been completely competent to face Liadrin with a good chance of being superior to her. At that stage, they're match. However, he has completely degraded afterwards, and not merely because of his physical transformation. While Yadrin kept fighting at close range, she just ceased to be a priestess. It must appear that Nabundo, despite his merits, is inferior to her in terms of direct battle. The battle capability edge goes to Yadrin. Oh, lad, there's an inscription on the dais. It's a warning. It says, Whomsoever takes up this blade shall wield power eternal. Just as the blade rends flesh, so must power scar the spirit. It is unclear exactly which pieces of equipment Liadrin uses, since she is depicting in various sets of armor and artworks, and since the items she uses in World of Warcraft are not confirmed to canonically belong to her, it's hard to state that she possesses this item or that item. What is certain 
is that she is training the use of staffs since her priestess days and now knows how to use spears, maces and great swords, as well as simply joining the fray with the fists. Blood knights were first issued with blood-tempered rancers, as in spears tempered in the blood of demons, that were the symbol of blood knights, and Liadrin used one when she became the first of them. In the game, she is most often shown wearing the Redemption Armor, the third tier of Paladin raiding sets, recovered and purified from the desecrated armors of the fallen heroes of Naxramas. This pure armor notably increases the healing power and mana regeneration of Paladin. Although she might possess one, the Adrian is never depicting wearing a helmet, and that won't be the case here. She also owns a pure blood Thalassian warhorse, named Redemption, too. The most notable piece of equipment she has depicted with Vow uh, since appearance in Warlords of Draenor is the legendary runeblade Queldala. This quetch sword was one of the high blades enchanted by night elves with the assistance of dragons, tempered in dragon blood and forged with dragon fire. And in the world of Warcraft, Queldala is the sister blade of one of the Quelsara, whose remains were left in Kalimdor and recovered only recently by adventurers. Queldala was inherited by the High Elves after the War of the Ancients and went to one elf named Falorian Dawnseeker, who wielded it against the Amanis and later the Scourge during the invasion of Quelthalas. He died doing so, and the blade went to Lanathorn, one of Kael'thas' followers who fell to the might of the Scourge and left it broken, hating the weapon. When facing the Scourge, an animus adventurer refought the blood with Serenite, the blood of the old god Yog Saron, effused it with souls and purified it in the holy energies of Sunwell. In the game, you receive another weapon instead of Quellala if you play the priest, Druid of Shaman, since Quellala will not choose you as you are not trained in its use. Since it was relinquished to the Sun Rivers and the Silver Covenant for holy purposes, we can assume the quest was fulfilled by a blood elf priest, and now that the blade has been empowered by the Holy Sunwell, it would make sense for Liadrin to receive it. Here, we would assume that she is indeed wielding Queldala, which appears to highly increase the offense and defense of paladins such as Liadrin. It should also be infused with holy energy, the perfect weapon for the blood knight. She has also been depicted with a shield knotted cane. It can be added that she has the habit of wearing tabards and change them according to the faction she is fighting for, notably the Blood Knights, the Shattered Sun Offensive and the Silver Hand. A paladin armor set from the Argent tournament is notably named after the Adrian, but she doesn't appear to be wearing it. Prior to his transformation into a broken, Nabunde was equipped with a standard Vedigator armor and a crystalline armor of an Aru. The latter was taken from him by a former friend for being broken, and the former was destroyed in the Siege of Shadrath. Such items aren't adapted to his new body and his new powers though, and he hasn't been seen with them since. Nabundu is mostly depicted as wearing traditional shamanic robes, with a hood offering little protection, although some artworks show him wearing medium armor, matching that of shamans in game. In World of Warcraft, he mostly wears blue shamanic clothing, but in the Battle in the Exodus, he has been seen fighting on the front line wearing the fourth tier of shaman armor sets, the cyclone armor indicating again a strong connection to the element of wind, for which Nobundo seems to have a particular affinity. This set notably enhances mana regeneration, swiftness and strength. He is usually barehanded and relies on his powers to fight, but bears a religious staff on occasion. There is a shaman armor set from the Argent tournament named after him, but he has never been associated with it.
The question of what will be available to both combatants is a bit tricky, since there are many weapons they can use. Yaldrin will be equipped with Quellala and the Redemption Armor, while Nubundu will wear the Cyclone Armor and have a Hammer of Naru at his disposal, should he wish to use one. Even considering this, there is no way for Nubundu to overcome the legendary items that Yadrin gathered, especially without a man he can ride. Right now, it appears clear that Lady Yadrin must twin the equipment edge. All my life I have lived by the sword. I've seen kingdoms burn and watched brave heroes die in vain. Lady Liadrin has been active since at least before the Second War, having fought against the Amanis and the Old Hall as a priestess of the light. She faced the scourge the same way, and led the life of a warrior after the Third War, until Kaif has since tried out the tents of the moon with Mumu, and led to the creation of Blood Knights. Since then, she has fought in the War of Outland, liberated Quildenas, sent off order to war against the Elite King, and led to the Shadow Council in Draenor, before besieging Suramad itself. As such, she has thus in varied experience of battle, both in and out of the fight, and it could be argued that this is all she has. Extremely proud of Blood Knights and her abilities, she tends to be more of a soldier than a preacher, solving problems by the sword and not much else. Although humbled by how the Sun Well was revived, she tends to be ruthless in battle, especially against beings she perceives as enemies of her people. Anyone fighting her, that is, especially the scourge and demons. However, she remains a compassionate person and has a soft spot to our drain eyes, since they were the ones to bring the Sunwell back to life. Nabundo's age is unknown, but he has been fighting for at least half a century, and probably much more than that. By the Battle of Shatrad, he was already a very experienced Vindicator, able to face Gromash Hellscream in battle and maybe even defeat him. Even with his entire body broken, he instinctively fled the battlefield with the future in mind. That's an abundo. Always anticipate. Always think about the future. He has survived in the Shattered Outland for decades, even if his people should have been all but wiped out. And despite being broken, Nothing managed to make him give up. The Battle of the Exoda proved his sense of tactics is intact, as well as his determination to sacrifice for others if necessary, and he will always foresee the ways which will best serve everyone's interests. Clarity about the future and what track needs to be followed is one of the greatest strength Nabundo acquired by becoming a shaman. Nabundu and Yadrin have comparable battle experiences with continuous strife, great determination, the ability to change and adapt, and having both rose up from shattering defeats. Two factors set them considerably apart, however. Age and vision about the future. Liadrin is rather young for a blood elf, and even with her high lifespan, Nabundu's is even greater. He must have had much experience of war, Aside from this, the Adrian is but a soldier. She reacts to threats and fights what she is assigned to fight. She doesn't need to foresee things beyond that. Nobundo does it constantly, which is what makes him such a wise and respected shaman. The battle experience edge clearly goes to Nobundo. In secret, I began harvesting what energies I could. I had a brief taste of true power. <laughs> it 
Theodrin started out as a priestess of the light, one of the high elves who had received the worship of the holy light and its benefits from their human allies. These elven priests used to focus heavily on healing, and so did Liadrin, although she showed prominence in the ability to transfer her own pain to others. After the Third War, her own doubts prevented her from accessing the light again, and she came to hate it and its principles. As a blood knight, she forcefully stole the energy of the light from the body of the Narun Mungu in a brutal relationship that was painful to both and made the Blood Knight's powers weaken with distance. Since the restoration of the Sunwell, Blood Knights have been getting their powers from it, giving them a much more harmonious relationship to the Holy Light, especially for the former priestess that was Liadrin. Clearly a retribution paladin, Liadrin is able to attack offensively with the Light, all around her in one go, and empower each and every of her strikes with essentially making her a high-powered up warrior. Each and every of her strikes will be massive, and she gains more and more holy power as she fights, which she can suddenly spend to heighten her damage output. She can, of course, heal herself, heavily slow her enemies down, absorb attacks. Quendala notably enhances her strength further, and the redemption armor leave her healing abilities at the same level she had when she was a priestess. Liadrin can be considered a model for all retribution paladins there are, and has more faith than most blood knights. You could also add that she, like all blood elves, can absorb surrounding mana for a limited extent, and she in particular must be highly attuned to the absorption of holy energy. Nabundu was a Vindicator, a paladin of the Draenei, but all of his connection to the Light was lost when his body was corrupted by the red poison vaporized and chattered by the Orgish Horde. Despite this, he never lost faith, maintained trust in the Light and a complete knowledge of it. Damage coming from him isn't likely to disturb him, he would basically shrug the pain off effortlessly. Disregarding this, Nabundu is a shaman, one that was trained directly by the shattered elements of Outland, which removes the usual connection of such mystics to the spirits of ancestors. Nobundo is a bringer of peace, believing that everything that is, is alive. He is described as a pharaoh, a highly trained shaman who has come to a degree of wisdom enabling him to foresee the future. Given his personality, his methods, in the healing buff granted by the wrist's armor called Nobundo's Redemption, he appears to be a restoration shaman, talented in the use of water, although his greatest talent is his natural connection with the wind. Unlike in-game shaman, he doesn't seem to be using totems and doesn't belong to a totemic culture. He is most likely to be an expert at the cleansing of his mind and those of others, is likely to fight at very high speed thanks to the power of the wind and free himself from movement and permanence. His healing talents imply various abilities to regenerate himself and others, both in health and mana, making him hard to kill and a great set to a group. He should notably be able to cast spells while moving. The benevolent power of life and wind allow him to propel himself in the air, convert damage into healing, and in case of emergency, ascend to a winged being able to surround himself in a protective and offensive storm. He should also be able to reduce the damage on himself by shifting into the astral plane, see from any distance, and disturb all of his enemies with wind gushes. His cyclone armor only enhances all of his abilities. Nabundo and Yadrin both have a very strong mystic bond with the forces empowering them, but while those forces are very different, we can notice clear differences. First, Yadrin is a much more physical fighter than Nabundo, and despite her great talent in the light, he is more of a magical combatant, despite being from a hybrid class too. He has been a shaman for a longer time than Yadrin has been a blood knight, and he has one great advantage against her. Having been a paladin himself, he knows how her powers work through her, what she can do, 
the nature of her abilities and how to counter them. She doesn't have the same advantage against a shaman. Because of his experience, proficiency in magic use and spiritual knowledge, Nabundo wins the magical edge. Faith is a powerful weapon. So I'm told. The Alliance has the light from which to draw its strength. What steals this iron horde in its darkest hours? In the conflict between the Alliance and the Horde, the elements and the Holy Light have often been violently opposed as the religious backbones of both factions. The four elements are the fundamental components of the physical realm to which a fifth, common in all things and in all the universe, can be added. Spirit. The Holy Light is the very first fundamental force to manifest into being, and it is basically love and compassion made into spiritual energy. It's an emotional fluid, which can exist in solidified form in the ethereal beings known as the Naru. In the case of Liadrin, the arcane found that is the sun well furnishes her with a light, ever since the hurt of Muru, the Naru, was plunged into it to purify it. It would be interesting to compare the lights in the fifth element of spirit, but nothing makes one more efficient against the other. Even being a broken, Nobundo is not corrupt enough to be more damaged by holy attacks than anyone else. No edge can be gained from a magical comparison. You Pandaren tried to bury your hate and your anger. But such power cannot be contained. It must be unleashed! The Adrian has had a traumatic life. Her talent and her faith were shattered, and then she lived in darkness until a brutal rekindling of her relationship with the light was offered to her. She fully embodies the trope of a usual retribution paladin, consumed with a selwatch's need for revenge, which blinded her and prevented her from seeing what was happening to her apprentice Galal. She's been driven by a mixture of hope, rage, guilt and pride, all of which could have led her to a very dark path had Muru not sacrificed himself for the redemption of Blood Elf. Ever since then, Liadrin has been a troubled individual who has been lost for a very long time and just found her own path again. She is a good person deep down, filled with compassion, but ruthless against anyone she perceives as a threat and very distrustful of anyone except other selves. Her virtue is now filled with sincere gratitude toward the Draenei. When she is set on a warpath, anything other than aggressive and prideful action will make her fearful of making a mistake and distrustful of anyone suggesting it. After seeing the world crumble so many times, she is simply very unsure of herself, except when she can solve problems by being a shining hero. She is both fragile psychologically and strong beyond belief. The Bundo has been broken both in mind and body. When he was left in the ruins of Shatra, crushed and unable to reach the Holy Light, he had lost everything and might as well have been dead. He kept going on, however. He kept on living for a hope without form. He just did. He prayed for years. He opened his heart and mind that despite the broken thing he had become, his faith accomplished a miracle. His newfound power was first used to reunite all of his brethren, and it appears that he is incapable of hate or anger. His mind is a perfect example of a holy Draenei, completely pure, selfless and compassionate even with those who are cruel and unfair to him. His ability to foresee what even the land cannot predict, not by knowing but by feeling, 
pushes him to always do the right thing even when not knowing why it is right. He is far from immune to suffering and until he understood what was going on, he was plagued with depression and horrible nightmares that no amount of suffering seems to be able to bring him down. Nobundo has one of the most stable psychological states of Azeroth and Draenor. Even in their behaviors and mental states, Yadrin and Nobundo share strangely common traits, having gone through similar experiences and found unlikely forms of redemption by choosing, despite their helplessness, to keep going on a new path. However, it is very clear that Nobundo is much more stable and sure of himself now, Yadrin still being prideful and rather unstable. Nobundo is the reverse of that. Furthermore, she'd have a hard time harming a holy drain eye such as him. Her goodwill will hinder her rather than protect her. Nobundo wins the psychological edge. To ask why we fight is to ask why the leaves fall. It is in their nature. Perhaps there is a better question. The fight would occur in the eye of the storm, the chaotic battleground of Outland near Neverstorm, where Draenei and Blood Elves were often opposed to the control of the raw energy just lying there. It's hard to imagine what could draw Liadrin and Nobundo to oppose in a death match, but I think one possibility could be their refusal to see any more lies from the Alliance and the Horde lost from control of the Eye. They would have agreed on a one-on-one, -on -one, definitive duel by Orkish tradition so that the matter could be settled with only one last death. Always ready to sacrifice themselves or others, Liadrin and Nabunde would have agreed to put their lives at stake. The winner will have again control of the entire place for their faction. Liadrin would enter the field with her redemption armor, her blood knight tabard and mounted on her Phalassian war horse, Quedera in hand. Nabunde would have come with a cyclone armor and a heavy hammer of an arrow he wields slowly. Both would slowly walk up to the center of battleground at the edges of a central rock bridge, and then at each other, without saying a word for a while, unwilling to kill someone they know is honorable, but ready to go all the way through if necessary. Liadrin would clearly be the first to attack, charging on her horse to hit Nabundu with full force and end it quickly. Before the broken would make a move, she would strike his head through the light and hold from a distance in order to force him to stay in place and be struck down. This was exactly what the Broken would have anticipated, however, since this is obvious Paladin strategy, and would wait for the last moment to use the power of the wind to free himself from the light's hold and propel himself forward, slightly to the side, while setting the head of his armor on the path of the horse's legs. Latrin would understand the trap, but too late. Redemption's legs would be shattered by the hammer strike breaking under his own force and that of the wind. Her horse would collapse and slip into the nether with a horrible cry of pain, her mistress landing brutally on the ground on the other side of the bridge. Yadrin would be dismounted, but safe, and extremely hungry. Nabunde would turn around, Yadrin would rise up, and the opponents would face one another again for a second before moving again. The Draenei knows that Liadrin completely dominates him physically, and now she knows that the spells she can use to hold him in place won't work. This means she'll try to get to him as fast as she can. This means fleeing. When the Blood Elf starts gleaming and walking ominously toward her enemy, a threatening shine and a golden eyes, the only thing Nobundo can do is turn around again and dash away thanks to the power of the wind his feet barely touching the ground. His plan is to stay at a distance and attack from afar with spells, but Yadrin, as a former warrior and prominent physical combatant, is much faster than the Broken would expect. 
She would dash across the bridge like a lightning and reach the other side in no time. Not faster than Nubundo, but too fast for him to quickly get away. The broken would find himself confronted with a pissed off blood knight and would owe his life only to the sturdiness of his hammer, able to parry and deflate a violent strike from Quellala. The crystal would hold, but not the shaft, and under Liadrin's sheer holy strength, the hammer of the Naru would break, leaving Nobundo with only a staff to defend himself. Ready to strike down judgment upon her enemy, Liadrin would raise her sword and aim for the head, screaming. Her hand, however, would be pulled back at the last moment by a strongest of wind. Nobundo, in an effort to save his life, would have unleashed the wind against her to loosen her grip of Quedala and disarm her in order to even the fight. Yadrin would hold on to the sword with all her strength and a natural wind trying to pull it away from her, and Nobundo would land heavy thrust of his staff in her face and gut in order to make her drop the sword. He could be way more offensive if he wanted to, but this is not his specialty, and the shaman still has the hope of subduing his enemy to end the fight without bloodshed. His blows are heavy, but Liadrin can take it with only her patience being damaged, and would end up grabbing Nabundo's staff with her other hand. Both held up against each other, Liadrin would use her superior agility to kick Nabundo to the gut and face while holding onto the weapons, and while this would hurt, he can take much more than that. This would be a battle of patience. Obviously lost by Liadrin, he would, well, let go of the sword and bury her heavy armored fist in the broken face. Who would be thankful for once that it doesn't have a nose? Dismayed, Nobundu would be held to the ground, viciously beaten by Liadrin, with only his sullen arms to defend himself. A broken bone later, he would do the only thing he can still do. Thinking she has proved herself superior of nothing but her physical strength, Yadrin would be rather overconfident. She would not raise her defenses and be surprised when winds suddenly come hurling from all sides and shake her violently while entering Nabundo's flesh and briefly making him into an air ascendant. The twirling silhouette of a drain eye would rise up in the air, lifted by pure elemental power. Yadrin would refuse to let him go but will hardly do more than holding on without being heard away into the nether. While Nabundo is hitting himself in a hard state of meditation, she would rely on her last and greatest weapon, the light. Illuminating her entire body, her immune strength will allow her to oppose the power of the elements and grab onto the enemy, screaming and making holy fire rain upon the both of them. They would turn for a second and their own combined powers and then the explosion of the spells would propel the both of them away from the other. Nabundo would be thrown away onto the edge of the eye, risking a fall, while Yadrin's armor and greater resistance would leave her falling at the entrance of the bridge. Both would be heavily wounded, maybe a broken limb or two, with scars on Yadrin's face and burns all over Nabundo's body. He would barely be able to move, and would not them so, his focus will be to heal himself rapidly, fix his limbs and mend his flesh. Liadrin, still bathed in a sacred hollow, would be rapidly regenerating herself and would not fail to size the occasion while her opponent is weak. Her hair detached and her tabard gone, the blood elf would run to Nobundo and use a full knowledge of light against him, transferring her own pain onto him. This would be enough to make anyone howl in pain but Nobundo has seen worse. Without fear, he would remain close to the edge, chanting to the elements to mend his body and slow Yadrin's advance with the wind. The angry blood knight would get closer and closer nonetheless, showering Nobundo with holy judgment. The broken, however, is completely used to the pain, and the horrific burning and regrowth of his flesh would only leave him in a robust state of trance. Since he's not moving, Gliadrin is trying to reach him and push him off, but once close to the drain eye, she would find herself unable to move farther. Normally, she would just keep burning him with the light, but Nobuto seems to feel most no pain to be immune to the suffering brought by her judgment. Frustrated and impressed, Gliadrin would consecrate the ground and make the rock itself burn in holy fire, 
doing anything she can to attack. At this moment, Nobunde would heavily stomp the ground with his foot, then seemed to lose all his focus and tremble, exhausted by his efforts. Gladwin would feel the resistance of the wind vanish and would dash to finish her opponent immediately. Nobunde counted on this, however. As the light closes in to burn him, the far seer would shift to the astral plane and basically phase through Liadrin with no harm, becoming physical again behind her. Turning around, Liadrin would understand the trap. The cracks on the ground are already visible. The very earth Liadrin is standing on is aiding her enemy and crumbling at her feet to drop her into the twisting nether. Running like hell to try and survive, she would end up falling among the debris and grabbing onto the remaining edge by one hand, with Nobundo standing over her. The hooded and disfigured silhouette of a broken would loom over for a minute, silent, while she frantically tries to climb up and find a way to survive. He would then kneel down and offer his helping hand, while stating, Now, Lady Yardrin, you have lost. Being faced with the choice of taking his hand and risking betrayal, and slowly slipping to death, Liadin would actually hesitate. In the end, she would take the broken hand, guided by what she recognizes as faith. The shaman would help her, saving her life, and once on her feet, she would understand that now she simply couldn't attack again. All that would be left to do would be to concede defeat, meaning that she had indeed lost. Both wounded and heavy with thoughts for the future, the Adin and Nobunde would help each other limp back to their respective encampments. Both would stand by their decision. Nobunde would think of a blood knight who had faith in him when they were trying to kill each other the second before. The Adrian would think of a wretched shamanic creature who had reached the position of the eye of a storm rather than kill cold blood. He still has probably not settled that issue but it certainly has and should renew trust between Bladas and Draenei for the future. Well, Nobunder won. Or did he? This was supposed to be a death match, and he failed to end his opponent's life. Shouldn't this be a draw? The problem with setting fictional death matches is that they ignore the character's morals and give an unfair disadvantage to those who would refuse killing. Nubundu had the knowledge and forethought to rid Liadrin of her mount and her weapon, and as long as he managed to stay away, her strength and resistance were useless to her, effectively making him the better suited combatant in this situation. Liadrin's talent and magical resources would have been more than enough to match his magical power had it been a lengthy battle, and she would eventually have caught him to him. What Nubundu did was prevent this, and survive long enough to trap her in a situation where the fight would have been decided without the death of one or the other. His greatest advantages were his experience and his wisdom. The hindrance of his morals were taken into account, and he won anyway. The winner is the Farseer Nobundo, High Shaman and Champion of the Earthen Ring. Thanks for watching this video! I was interested in making something about characters who are not necessarily on the forefront of the main lore. They're sometimes more interesting than bigger figures, and since these two never met, I wanted to do exactly that. Next time, I'll take the opposite direction and show a fight between none other than the two most powerful creatures of the entire Warcraft lore. As a rough might get destroyed a bit. Oh well. Subscribe and like if you want to see that happen. And until next time.